Three quarters of our planet is covered in water. The great oceans are sparsely populated, equivalent to huge deserts. Creatures of the deep must travel far in search of food. But here and there, submerged mountain peaks break through the waves. Remote islands in a desert sea. Ocean oases. Millions of years ago, over a vast time span in the area we now call the Pacific Ocean, enormous pent-up forces broke through weak points in the Earth's crust. Volcanoes are still active in this great ring of fire, still reshaping the landscape. They erupted, cooled, erupted again, forming islands large and small. Lakes of sulfurous acid, vents of steam and gases, bubbling mud which cooled, solidified, all sculpted a desolate landscape. Then came the Ice Age. Glaciers gouged out the valleys. Temperatures rose and rivers carved their way to the sea. These were the forces which formed two large islands in the southwest Pacific. The Dutch explorer Abel Tasman first discovered these shores in 1642 and gave the country its modern name, New Sea Land. But he sailed on without landing. Over a hundred years later, the Englishman Captain James Cook arrived on the shores of South Island, but the seas were too rough to land. He returned almost exactly three years later in his ship the Resolution and became the first European to set foot on this new land. On the 26th of March 1773 he entered Dusky Sound, one of several long deep inlets now called Fjordland. His description of the scene is as true now as it was over 200 years ago. A prospect more rude, craggy and desolate than this country affords from the sea cannot possibly be conceived. For as far inland as the eye can reach, nothing appears but the summits of rocks, which stand so near together that instead of valleys, there is only fissures between them. Captain Cook's original charts and soundings are still used as a basis for modern charts, which are essential for today's explorers. Sudden storms and wild seas guard this land which is still largely untouched by man. Even fewer people have explored the rich world that exists only a few feet below the surface. In these cold waters, there's a diversity of life that truly makes it an ocean oasis. Subtropical fish like these butterfly perch have adapted to waters fed by Antarctic currents rich in plankton, a plentiful supply of food for the fish that live among the kelp forests. A young scorpion fish ventures out, well camouflaged to blend with its surroundings. A huge crayfish stands guard at the entrance to its home. Keeping an eye out for danger is an ultra-cautious octopus. Normally a master of disguise, this one has had a close brush with a very determined predator. With six of its tentacles gone, it can't afford to lose any more. In colder waters like these, there are usually fewer species to be found, but here there's a considerable variety. The jaws of a mado have bands of tiny teeth, ideal for grazing the minute organisms on the rocks. If anything tries to taste a scorpion fish, it will get a mouthful of poisonous spines.
carpets of different seaweeds thrive in waters rich in nutrients. Among them shelter the smaller forms of marine life that support fish like the banded wrasse. A much rarer sight is the wandering sea anemone. It grips the weed with its sucker foot, capturing any passing food in its tentacles. Then it lets go and rolls on somewhere else in the current. Other creatures are entirely masters of their underwater world. It's playtime for the local fur seals. Inquisitive and friendly, they can't resist checking out any newcomers. For speed and agility, they're more than a match for any human swimmer. Out of the water, they're slow and clumsy, for they have no natural enemies on land. But after Captain Cook's voyage became known, professional hunters arrived and pursued them ruthlessly for their warm fur coats. Caught on the rocks, they were easy prey and after some 200 years were almost wiped out. Now, thanks to being a protected species, they're a thriving community again. At last, it's safe to take it easy. On the rocky outcrops, fjordland crested penguins enjoy preening in the sunshine. Like the fur seals, they're awkward out of the water, but they've never been such a target for hunters, and there are large populations on the hundreds of small islands dotted around fjordland. Between the sea and the guarded burrows where they raise their chicks, they always take the same route. Home for a crested penguin is a cosy burrow among the tree roots, giving shelter from the severe storms. On remote islands without predators, evolution produces birds that can't fly, like the weka, which is one of four flightless birds native to New Zealand. Penguins are flightless birds too. Their wings have adapted to flippers. Fjordland, one of New Zealand's national parks, takes its name from the 14 long, narrow, extremely deep trenches gouged out by the glaciers. This beautiful area is even more remarkable underwater. But finding the right place to dive needs special navigational aids Captain Cook would never have dreamed of. We're looking for a submerged mountain rising from a thousand feet with its peak 45 meters below the surface. Diving here is different, and it's because of rainwater. Fjordland is one of the wettest places in the world, with up to nine meters of rain every year. It filters through the dense vegetation, cascading down the cliffs into the sea. There's so much rainwater that a three to four meter layer of it containing tannin from the leaves, floats on top of the denser salt water. This underwater mountain is also forested with huge coral bushes. Under their snowy white exterior is a black skeleton Black coral grows only a centimetre a year, and these butterfly perch are swimming through branches several hundred years old. Snake starfish clean the delicate coral by feeding on the silt washed down from above. Black coral was once so prized for its use in jewelry that in some places it has become almost extinct, but now it's a protected species.
In this part of Doubtful Sound, known as the gut, there's one of those deep living species normally impossible for divers to study. On an unusually flat and sandy area, there's a large population of sea pens, feathery quills sieving the water for food. Very little is known about these beautiful creatures. We do know they need a current to bring the plankton that forms their staple diet. They can also float away, using their feathery body like a sail, and settle down again on a different spot. Sea pens can be found living as deep as 6,000 meters, so it's astonishing to be able to see so many of them here at the gut. Nearby, another deep water species, miniature red corals, sharing the top of this underwater mountain with the sea pens. At this depth, only the green wavelength of light penetrates the freshwater filter above. Another rarity, the tube anemone. If threatened, it can withdraw into its tube-shaped shell. Returning to the surface, we pass dense patches of sea anemones and enter the upper layer of fresh water. Here we find another peculiarity of Fjordland, the constant struggle for survival between the starfish and the mussels. Starfish will die in fresh water, but given the chance, they'll feast on the mussels that have somehow adapted to live in a narrow band on the border of the salt and fresh water their survival is directly linked to the rainfall above. These conditions make it difficult for divers too. The cold water from the snows of the mountains mixed with the denser seawater can be very disorientating. It's not easy to read a computer or depth gauge in this oily cocktail. The freshwater runoff from Fjordland's steep cliffs seems to present no problems for the bottlenose dolphins who live here. While the great fjords of the South Island are a legacy of the Ice Age, the North Island was partly shaped by fire, and in places, the fires are still burning. White Island in the Bay of Plenty is an active volcano 30 miles out into the ocean. The enormous heat generated by the movement of continental plates under the seabed is the powerhouse beneath it. In White Island's crater, a lake of lethal temperature bubbles and steams. Its vapors a witch's brew of poisonous gases. From 1880 up to the early 1930s, various enterprises produced sulfur here, between the volcanic eruptions. One of the worst was in 1914, when a lava flow buried the works, killing all ten men. An eruption in 1933 blew half-ton boulders 200 feet into the air, along with steam, fumes, and volcanic ash. Another eruption destroyed the side of the crater, showering the seabed with boulders and leaving a rim only a few meters above sea level. The crater itself is below sea level. In this shallow, light-filled water, there are constant reminders of the enormous forces trapped underneath. The molten rock rumbles ominously below, releasing sulfur dioxide gas which bubbles up through the seabed. Science suggests that life itself began in geothermal systems like these, and certainly the algae, primitive plants clinging to cracks and crevices, thrive in this environment.
Perhaps the warmer water, sunlight and nutrients from the bubbling gases provide the perfect conditions for seaweeds and marine life in this unique island oasis. Fish also thrive here. This black angelfish is nearly 20% larger than its relatives off the mainland coast. A large sandagger's wrasse cruises among the kelp. As soon as it moves, a scorpion fish becomes visible. Propelled by its broad tail, it makes for another resting place. It too is larger than usual. The long narrow jaws and sharp teeth of the red pigfish are ideal for dealing with the small shellfish that it likes to eat. Goatfish use their sensitive barbels to sift out food from the volcanic sands. About half a mile from the shores of White Island's main crater, lie the jagged remains of a huge lava flow that spilled out and solidified. It formed an underwater cliff which drops away into very deep water. It was Captain Cook again who called this part of the ocean the Bay of Plenty, and nothing much has changed in the 200 years or more since he was here. Near the surface are big shoals of mackerel, Lower down, blue mau mau feed on the plankton brought in by the ocean currents. Not far from here, a trench over a thousand feet deep diverts part of the Antarctic current towards White Island. Fish have various ways of protecting themselves. Trigger fish, or leather jackets, have a rough skin like sandpaper. Puffer fish inflate themselves when in danger. Their spiny bodies deter would-be predators. The rags and tatters of scorpion fish help them disappear into their natural habitat. A pigfish hides among the kelp, a cold water seaweed growing among soft corals and sponges. They've all found an anchorage in the debris thrown out by the volcano. In this luxuriant growth, a multitude of lifestyles is supported. An exotic nudibranch or sea slug grazes on the weed. Feathery plants that are actually animals cling onto the underside of rocks and caves, raking the ocean for their food. Another rumble from the volcano reminds us of the enormous natural powers in this corner of the Pacific Ocean. In a potentially more dangerous way, man has chosen this part of the world to experiment with his own destructive forces. More than one country has tested its nuclear weapons in the remote Pacific, and in 1985, the French selected Mururoa Atoll. The New Zealand government protested against the tests and welcomed the Greenpeace boat Rainbow Warrior and its crew, who were planning a blockade at Mururoa. In Auckland Harbour, a French Secret Service agent placed two explosive devices on the hull. Shortly before midnight on July the 10th, 1985, two explosions ripped open the boat and killed one of the men on board. A few months later, the bomber and his accomplice were convicted of manslaughter. In 1987, the warrior, damaged beyond repair, was towed a hundred miles north to Matari Bay, a Maori sacred burial site, and here she was finally laid to rest.
The ship settled on the sandy bottom 25 meters down. Within hours, marine bacteria and microscopic plants had formed a thin film over much of the surface, the foundation for the dense colonization that exists today. Ten years on, the bow rails are festooned with marine growth. Kelp, small corals, sponges and anemones all compete for space on this now crowded ship. Once the colonies of weeds and sponges had established themselves, the fish moved in, taking advantage of these rich new feeding grounds. Leather jackets and shoals of sweepers glide through the fallen superstructure. The interior shelters many species like red striped moki and scorpion fish. Wires and cables dangling from the collapsing bridge are anchorages for anemones and crinoids that feed on currents. A solitary John Dory seeks its prey here, where every inch is crammed with life. It's almost as if nature has something to celebrate. An ordinary steel handrail has been transformed by dual anemones. Nature has welded these railings in its own way, and the leather jackets are like caretakers who inspect them, keeping them shipshape with their chisel-like teeth. In ten years, the steel plates of the Rainbow Warrior's hull have become a dazzling patchwork of anemones and sponges. But already, the deck timbers have been weakened by shipworm and will eventually collapse. After many more years, the whole ship will be nothing but a heap of corroded metal plates, and finally, even these will disappear. In the meantime, it's an artificial oasis pulsing with life. At least for a few more years, the Rainbow Warrior lives on. A short distance to the south are the Poor Knights, a group of rocky islands, the tops of a sunken volcanic rim. They're now a marine reserve, and in 1997, fishing here was banned completely. Hundreds of ledges on the limestone cliffs are home to many seabirds, including several gannet colonies. In places, the cliffs have eroded into spectacular formations. At the Poor Nights, cold water from the south meets warmer subtropical currents from the north supporting one of New Zealand's most unusual and diverse underwater habitats. In this vast cavern, the sea temperature can vary several degrees from one side to the other. Stingrays, normally at home in warmer waters, swim among fronds of kelp, a cold water seaweed. Deeper in the cave, shoals of blue Mau Mau feed on the rich supply of plankton brought on the currents. For the diver, visibility can vary from 30 to only 3 meters, depending on the amount of plankton in the water. Other fish, like the Sandagger's wrasse, have blunt teeth for grinding up limpets and bivalves that live in these underwater caverns. Another species with a taste for hard food patrols below the seaweed. The Poor Knights Islands, like Fjordland, support a diversity of life which could not exist 
without this special mixture of cold and warm currents. With over 9,500 miles of coastline and many hundreds of smaller islands, New Zealand's coastal waters are largely unexplored, even today.